Welcome. My name is Joe Neal, and I'll be your moderator today for our forum on discrimination in America. I'm an editor at, uh, I'm a science and health editor at National Public Radio in Washington. Uh, we're here today to look at a very important issue, and it's per pernicious uh, discrimination in America, focusing today on the African American community. NPR, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health have undertaken a poll that's unprecedented in its documentation of people's personal experiences with discrimination. We surveyed seven groups uh, and we're producing reports on each of these groups. We'll be releasing those over time over the next several weeks because we want to focus in on the particular experiences of discrimination that each group has rather than just comparing and contrasting all the groups at once. We think this will help um, illuminate the discussion and elevate the discussion. Um, and this is all part of a series that's starting on NPR today uh, called You, Me, and Them, uh, which reflects one of the main findings that we found in this big survey that you're going to be hearing more about in a moment. Uh, that everyone in Amer the major groups in America, the major racial, ethnic, and identity groups in America feel they are being that their group is being discriminated against. Um, we have uh, a distinguished panel here today. I'll start uh, by introducing on my immediate right uh, Dr. Robert Blendon. Bob is the professor of health policy and political analysis at the Harvard Chan School and the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, David Williams, uh, professor of public health uh, in the Department of Pro Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Chan School. Elizabeth Hinton, assistant professor in the Departments of History and African American Studies at Harvard University. And she's the author of the book, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America. Next to her is Dwayne Proctor. Dwayne is a senior advisor to the president and director of the Achieving Health Equity Portfolio at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And joining us from California is Mary Lee, who is deputy director of PolicyLink. Now, before we get started, we have a slide that I want to put up uh, that shows the seven groups that we surveyed. And so we're going to start, as I said, with African Americans and then move through this list approximately one week at a time uh, through the beginning of December and releasing the results in waves. Uh, this event is presented in collaboration with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and NPR. We are streaming this live on the websites of the forum and on NPR, and we're also streaming it on Facebook. Uh, the program will include a brief Q&A toward the end, and you can email your questions to the forum, that's one word, the forum, at hsph.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat that's now going on on the forum website. So before we hear from our panelists, let's take a look at a video called What You Should Know About Young Men of Color. It was uh, prepared by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It was shot in 2015, and unfortunately, very little has changed since then as our poll has found. Being a young man of color in 2015, it's a job. It's a job 24-7. It is our duty to fight for our freedom! It is our duty to fight for our freedom! You have to worry about being profiled, being stereotyped, having to watch your back from the people who are supposed to help you. If I get pulled over, I have to be extra cautious. Can I see your license and registration? They may be thinking I'm going for a gun or something, you know? Like, I have to keep that in the back of my mind all the time. We are being murdered at a very high rate. Black trans folk, um, black gender non-conforming folk, black women, black men, we are um, hunted. Um, and it's very scary. They're putting millions of dollars into building police stations inside of schools. So instead of putting resources towards things that make students feel better, you, you put in the police officers that make them feel like they're going to prison every time they wake up in the morning. They don't understand that just because one thing is trying to get fixed 
there isn't something else that's pushing you towards the edge. You got things like immigration pushing against you, police brutality. People really need to work on, on things as a whole. There's this um, general um, narrative that black people don't care. That narrative is a myth. Actually, we care very much, very deeply. People like me have, you know, are pursuing careers in college. We're, you know, taking leadership roles, you know, in our schools. We are educated and we want to make change in the communities that we grew up in. You are always here, always there. You are a walking miracle, a walking spiritual, a walking gospel, a song ready for the entire nation to sing. So lift it, lift your tongue and speak life, provide life, use joy as a resilience. You are a walking revolution, never to repeat, never to repeat and repeat and repeat for you cannot run out of time. You are time, you are eternal. There's so many people out there who care so deeply, as that young man said in the, in the video, uh, but they're working against the odds. Um, Bob, tell us more about what the poll found in terms of people's personal experiences of discrimination. Uh, Joe, let me just put this in uh, context uh, a minute. Um, uh, this year, a major poll done by another group uh, found the country almost evenly split on the question today. Uh, is discrimination against the minority community a major problem or not? Uh, and with all that's going on, it'd be amazed to do that. And the qu question of this whole series is, how could we add to that discussion so people see things differently? And the reason why I say this is, th this survey is actually quite different. It, polling began in the 1930s, and almost all polls ask you about the country. How is the country going, this, that, for my group? This poll does not. A small number of polls in the 1930s asked you about your own life only. How is your life going? And then it drew broader conclusions from the lives of people. And it turns out that you get different answers when I talk to you about my life uh, than I do about talking about the nation. And when there's controversy, why you want to go back to people's lives is that the people who don't agree with you say it's a news event. It really didn't happen. Uh, it's an organization that got, got this going. Some political figures just stirring things up. They use that as a reason for saying that some poll says that this goes on. This whole set of series only asks people about their own lives uh, uh, for that, and they, in many issues, g give a different answer. Uh, second, the, uh, we don't ask people about the last month or last year. We ask them about their lives in general because your attitudes, what we just saw, are based on people's life experience. It's not what happened in the last month or, 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 or uh, last year. And so uh, what we did is take every sort of issue that's, that's in dispute. And so uh, everybody talks about institutional discrimination. So we asked them to show quickly about the major institutions that African Americans, uh, jobs, uh, uh, colleges, police, uh, courts, uh, housing, etc. And then we asked about personal interactions, which in in focus groups, people talk about it all the time. That is how somebody actually talked to me, treated me, uh, said something when I was in line. And then you go to a poll, it's all up here. No, it, there's a whole set of how am I treated in my, my daily life. So we ask people with a, very directly to talk about only their lives. Uh, in each of these areas. Uh, if you're an expert, you see a lot of discrimination as being around institutions. Most of the people we interviewed mostly blame people. They just don't see the institutional setting that people work on, they see people. So let's just take a quick look uh, at, at what people and said to us. Important is every question is about your life. It's not about the society or this, what has gone on in these areas. Uh, uh, first slide. Uh, so uh, this is your experience as an African-American uh, with various institutions. And so you quickly see uh, the question about, is this a significant issue in America? You have over half of people saying that they themselves were discriminated against in seeking a job. Uh, in, just like the film, in interacting with the police. 45% uh, that they tried to rent or buy something and feel because they were, they were African American. People said no uh, uh, for that. Uh, that there's discrimination in uh, uh, trying to get into college or staying there. 
uh, uh, using clinics, and one in five, and this debate has been going on with commissions and everything, uh, flat out and say, in my lifetime when I try to go vote, uh, someone basically discriminated to keep me from voting. Uh, and so let's look at the next one very quickly. Uh, so, uh, this is what was being discussed on, on the uh, side. So, this is not, do you think this is going on in America? This is you and your family. Uh, and so, uh, you have 60% of people we interviewed who are African American saying they are a close family member, were unfairly stopped or treated by the police. And when it ends up in court, which is exactly what we had, is 45% think the courts push them and treat them differently because they're black. This is their lives. We're not talking about the country. We're not talking about what I just saw. This is my life that I'm telling you in the interview. Uh, next, please. Uh, so, uh, this is the hidden issue, except for people who live this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, essentially, half of, of people we interviewed said that they spend part of their lives where people just say basically offensive statements to them about being black, whether in line or, or others. Uh, their racial slurs, people making fun on the uh, phone, they were giving you examples of how people would switch names or anything they wanted you to know about how this was, and the situation where they go in some place and people are instantly afraid of them. And again, we're reporting their life. We're not reporting anything about the broader. This is people talking about their, uh, their lives. Uh, one more. And so uh, it turns out that it also uh, leads people to, to make what to them is quite rational behavior, but quite worrisome uh, uh, for that. Uh, almost a third of the people uh, said that they're in some situation where they should be calling the police, but they won't do it because they're afraid of what the police will do if they arrive to them. Uh, forget the situation. And we've got uh, over one in five saying that I've been discriminated against at some source of medical care, and I, I'm just not going back, even though I know I should. They say I need it, but I just don't like the way I was treated. So before uh, we turn it over to the panel about what you do about it, there, there is a finding here, and the reason why I really want to emphasize this is uh, for people from other discussions and backgrounds, this is not what you call the American experience. And what do I mean by this is, in our survey, African Americans who earned higher incomes, which better education, everything else, report many more personal uh, slurs, discriminations, people being, it's, it's the uh, opposite. I have made it in American life and guess what? I am confronting things that just shouldn't be there. Likewise, if you're an African American living in the suburbs, you are much more likely to report that the police unfairly uh, pull you over. So, so the story, you get education, you get income, and these things disappear are not the story that we could find. Uh, we're having people saying to us, I, I, I've really done very well, and I am confronting these treatments. So that sort of opens up the discussion. But the thing I think we all want you to remember is, this is people talking about their lives. This is not a national discussion about an issue. This is my life, and they're sharing it with us, and that's the beginning of the conversation. Thank you, Bob. We uh, started our series on NPR this morning, our morning edition, looking at just that, the income disparity, which we found quite surprising. Uh, and we're going to be delving into that more and more over the series uh, as it unfolds. Uh, I want to turn now to, to um, David Williams and talk a little bit more about that last finding that Bob showed uh, concerning discrimination in healthcare. You're an expert in health disparities and one of the inspirations for this whole series, actually. And um, uh, tell us more what you see in the poll and what you're thinking. Well, I think this poll is very important because what it's doing, it's confirming with national data, as Bob said, based on the lived experiences of people, what a lot of scientific research has shown for a while. We have high quality scientific evidence that discrimination is pervasive across a broad range of contexts in American society. From stopping a taxi or even just intending to cross the street, uh, blacks and other minorities are discriminated against. And these experiences matter. They matter for economic advancement, they matter for access to education, and my work has focused a lot in the last two decades of how they matter for health. You see, in the United States, there are large racial disparities in health. 
Imagine with me for one minute a fully loaded jumbo jet with 200 passengers and crew taken off from Boston's Logan Airport and crashing today and everybody on board dying. And the same thing happens every day for the rest of this week and every day next week and every day next month and every day for a year. That's what we mean when we say that there are racial disparities in health in the United States. 200 African, over 200 African Americans die every day who wouldn't die if they had the same health experience of whites. And when my career started, most researchers thought that these disparities in health were simply a product of racial differences in income and education, which are quite striking. But what we now know is that at every level of income and education, there still is a racial gap in health. In fact, many of the racial gaps in health widen as you go from persons who've not finished high school to those who have a college degree or more education. So they are larger at the top than they are at the bottom of the income and education hierarchy. What drives this? Today, we now have research from the United States, from South Africa, from Australia, and New Zealand that documents that experiences of racial discrimination are a type of stressful life experience that helps to explain the racial differences in health that exist at every level of income and education. So discrimination matters. It matters profoundly. We have data for the United States that shows that discrimination is an independent predictor of premature mortality. These are not just experiences that give people a bad day. They're experiences that are pathogenic, that are literally uh, causing uh, premature death. And the discrimination within the healthcare context is only one type. It's all of these experiences are stressful when individuals are aware that they have been treated fairly uh, and poorly. And some of the evidence suggests that some of the most potent and pathogenic uh, aspects of discrimination are the little indignities that take place on a day-to-day -day basis, being treated with less courtesy and less respect and receiving poorer service than others and people acting like you're not smart. So this is, this is a wake-up call. And we really captured that in this the This is call. a wake-up call yeah. and this is something that we need to address. All right, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, you've examined the links between poverty, justice, um, and racism. Um, and we saw in Bob's slides that half of the African Americans uh, who responded in the poll report they had been personally discriminated against when interacting with the police. Uh, what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, the American criminal justice system is inherently racist and discriminatory. And the poll shows the, the ways in which that African Americans live their lived experience with that racist and discriminatory system. I think the video really illustrated the degree to which the young boys who were interviewed, how much police and being surveilled weighs heavily on their everyday lives. African Americans are more likely than their white or Latino counterparts to come into contact with police, to be arrested, and to be incarcerated. And I think that America's drug laws provide a really striking illustration of these kinds of disparities. So African Americans are about 12 percent of the population. They're about 15 percent of monthly drug users over the age of 18. Yet they're more than a quarter of people who are arrested for drug offenses and more than a third of those serving time in, um, in state and federal prisons for drug-related crimes. So in other words, African-American drug users are about four times more likely to be incarcerated for drug use than their white counterparts. And this, these kinds of disparities aren't new. They've been there since emancipation. Uh, the police community tensions that we saw in Ferguson aren't new. But these issues became exacerbated during the wars on crimes and drugs in the 1960s and 70s when national policymakers began to target low-income African-American communities with more surveillance, more police patrol, and eventually more incarceration. And the impact of that, the long-term impact of those choices over a 50-year period is what we're seeing in the poll results today. Thanks. Dwayne, tell us more about why the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is interested in this. And no, thanks efforts. for asking. Um, at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we've been working with others for a number of years to try to build a, a culture of health in America. That's our vision, and it's something that we're very serious about achieving. 
Um, when this uh, ideal came up of a culture of health, we understood that as long as there were health disparities in the country, the same health disparities that we're seeing right now, we would never get to uh, having a culture of health. Um, our understanding is also that um, you can have fluctuations in health disparities across health outcomes, across groups of people, um, by regions of the country, income, all sorts of things. And then sometimes those disparities, gaps, if they shrink, they can also widen again. They can be exacerbated over time unless you have health equity in place. And health equity for us means removing the barriers and obstacles uh, to good health that people um, come into contact with as they engage the other systems that are um, important to uh, their lives. So those systems are, um, for our, us public health people, the social determinants of health. We look at each one of those social determinants as a meta system, right? So if you have discrimination, that's one of those barriers, discrimination poverty, structural racism, structural genderism or sexism, and all the other structural isms. Those barriers impede our system's ability to serve our people in ways that will be very helpful um, uh, across the board. But when it comes to, right down to it, systems are, they sound very mechanistic, but they're actually people. People make up the systems and the systems that are there. So how do we look at these issues of uh, discrimination for the sake of this conversation as a barrier that clogs up our system's ability to serve folks? Now, if, uh, as the slide show, if African Americans are um, hesitant to call police when they need them, then that affects our public safety in our communities, uh, regardless of the incident that they're going through as they do their work. If African Americans are hesitant to um, engage the health care system, what does that do for public health? And what does that do for the health of a, of a group of people? And if African Americans are hesitant to, um, to seek higher education or to go for jobs that might seem uh, slightly beyond uh, their reach because of the discrimination and their, their fears of being discriminated against in these areas, what does that do to um, serve our nation and how does that help us get to a culture of health? And it doesn't, right? So we've got a number of programs that we're supporting uh, to this day to help alleviate some of these um, issues. We work with Fight Crime Investing Kids, a project of the Council for a Stronger America uh, that is rewriting police training uh, protocols, but rewriting them with community members at the same time. Some of those same gentlemen that were in the video that um, opened up are the types of uh, community uh, people that are giving input into the training program. Programs. The training programs are focusing on uh, things like uh, tra uh, traumatic experiences in childhood, looking at the adolescent brain so that police understand that when they encounter a young adolescent African American male that they know what they're dealing with and uh, not going with their perception. So we're also focusing on implicit bias. Um, Forward Promise was the program that was shown in the video where we are trying to invest in ways to improve the life outcomes for boys and men of color. We work with the Executives Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, uh, 40 foundations who are committed to alleviating uh, the situation that we're in. And um, because some of these things lend itself to uh, segregation um, in our communities and in housing, we also um, have uh, um, our county health rankings and roadmaps come out each year. Now we have measures for housing and, and racial segregation in our communities. Our Invest Health program works in 31 states, uh, mid-sized cities, also looking at these issues of how do we repair the systems that work so that they work better and they work better together, not in silos, to improve the um, health outcomes of the people um, that we're most interested in. So this report was very, very important because if discrimination is a barrier, then we need to lift up this conversation, think about how this really impacts the real lives of people, not on a national level, but individual lives, and then start talk about how do we uh, create our solutions that we seek to have. Thanks, it's a broad range of programs there and mm -hmm. efforts. Uh, Mary, I want to turn to you now. Uh, PolicyLink works in, on many of these structural issues that Duane just mentioned um, and how they appear on so many fronts. Your work focuses on how to create policies that address changes on a deeper level where discrimination is embedded. Tell us about the challenges with that and also about how it relates to some areas identified in our poll uh, such as job discrimination and housing, the, which are the top areas reported by our respondents. Well, I appreciate being able to join you this morning. And, you know, the poll itself, I think, really reflected the individual's encounter with, uh, with prejudice and bias. I'd like to spend a moment talking a little bit, not so much about the reactions of the, of the person that's being discriminated against, but the attitudes of the folks that are perpetrating the discrimination. As, as um, 
Mr. Proctor just indicated, those individuals have been policymakers. Those individual attitudes of bias, of prejudice, really can be traced into our policy and practices historically in this country. And, and that's the kind of connection to policy that even though an individual is just feeling a day-to-day -day discrimination and the poll got at that individual um, uh, individual reaction to it, it really is a much deeper systemic problem. So when we see those policies, those those practices that have been so so intractable, what we're not always able to appreciate is those individual prejudices have gone on to shape outcomes for people's lives in ways that they may not even be aware of. Where they live, uh, the way their communities have been laid out, zoning and land use policy, for example, just one example of how um, biased beliefs have had consequences that have transcended our, our society for, for generations. Um, for example, in housing, uh, refusal to make loans to people of color, particularly African Americans, was the basis upon which our Federal Housing Administration and, and Veterans Administration decided to make mortgages available. Whites benefited from those mortgages and also benefited from the ability to get homeowner's insurance. Blacks were redlined. And decades later, without perhaps even being aware of it, the implications can be seen in wealth. So that the typical white household has 16 times more wealth than an African-American family will. Those kinds of consequences, when you factor in the daily microaggressions that the poll has indicated with the blocks and barriers to opportunity and the health consequences that shorten lifespans, really create a, a reality for African Americans that's far different than that of white Americans. I think that's what um, you were getting at at the outset about the American dream not being a reality for many people. So just to bring it to the kind of work that PolicyLink has been um, engaging in with partners around the country, we look for ways to first remediate the kinds of systemic and and policy driven um, uh, oppression or or uh, limitations and opportunity and then we also look for new ways new systems new paradigms that can allow folks to live their lives the highest quality of life possible without having to navigate this minefield of of biased and prejudiced beliefs and attitudes um, and I'm hoping that during this conversation, we can go into some of those in specifics. Uh, some of those are, are things like uh, eliminating requirements on job applications that ask uh, applicants to disclose their criminal records, sometimes known as ban the box strategies. Um, we also look at larger wholesale approaches to employment that would require local hiring, for example, first source hiring. Um, we look at housing strategies that would not just interrupt the individual denial to rent to someone, which happens daily in this country based on race, but would also generate funds for uh, developing new housing or maintaining existing housing so that African Americans can enjoy uh, the, same, the same kinds of, of uh, environments and the same opportunities that other people in society can. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank you, Mary. Um, I'm sorry if there's a little bit of a transmission lag there, but uh, we heard most of, I think we heard everything you said. Um, we've talked now about the significant problems of discrimination, and I want to turn in the second half of the forum now to unpack uh, some of these and look for solutions. Uh, let's start with discrimination in policing and criminal justice and the criminal justice system, which we've talked about already here. And Bob, if you would, go over uh, some of the poll findings regarding police interactions. Uh, uh, so uh, there, and I think we've said this already, a really significant number of people who report in their life that they have been mistreated in interactions by the police. Also, the fear of calling the police. They're not saying they're uh, of a crime. They're afraid that they themselves are going to get involved uh, with a police issue. So there, there is an institutional issue of which 
the people uh, that I survey can't answer, and this is important, a point really back to Mary. People can tell you about the problems in their life. They can't tell you why they happened. And they can definitely not tell you about the institutional policies. So parents can tell you their schools aren't working, but they can't answer why. So essentially our colleagues here are gonna do the why. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can say is this is not a lot isolated incident uh, of we saw in a newscast somewhere in Missouri or another. Uh, this is a very broad situation where people live in fear of the police. Well, are there some model programs that address policing issues that, that we should be discussing and, and highlighting here? Elizabeth? Well, I think that uh, Dwayne hit, hit a couple of them, what's going on with um, fight crime and invest in kids. I think that during the Obama administration, we really witnessed a kind of new commitment to criminal justice reform um, and to scaling back mass incarceration. I think, unfortunately, we have a president who now um, who has pledged to restore law and order, and so we're seeing a return to some of the, the failed um, zero tolerance policing policies of, of the past. But what's very clear, and what I was particularly struck by in the poll, is that African Americans do not have a high level of trust in police, that a third of people don't a third of African Americans don't feel comfortable to call the police when they're in need and that and this was extremely troubling to me that more than a quarter uh, avoid doing ordinary everyday activities because of fear of coming into contact with police demonstrates just how fractured police community tensions are in the United States today and this obviously became uh, really clear and moved to the center of national discussions uh, beginning with the um, with the killing of Michael Brown in, in Ferguson. So a number of police departments are beginning to embrace reforms to help um, improve police leg legitimacy in low-income communities. So we have procedural justice training programs going on for police, implicit bias mm -hmm. training programs going on for, for police, which recognize that police carry sets of assumptions about um, racial and ethnic minorities that affects the way that they police and target certain communities. And so procedural justice as a way to kind of um, restore integrity and trust encourages police officers to treat everybody like a human being, um, not only to keep officers safer, but to, to improve general safety within the communities and make it more likely that people will um, feel comfortable to call the police when they're needed. So these, these programs are promising. They're mostly looking like training programs um, at this point. I think that we need to go further in terms of thinking about resources that communities need and in terms of empowering communities themselves to have some um, direction and voice over law enforcement in their communities. Another really important aspect of criminal justice reform are reentry programs for returning citizens from prison. I mean, we live in a mass incarceration society. We have the largest prison system on the planet. And as we think about decarcerating, we have to provide people with the fundal, fundamental resources they need to truly have a second chance. So the programs like Ban the Box um, that Mary mentioned are really important. Job training programs mm -hmm. are really important. But we also need a pipeline for jobs and education to formerly incarcerated people and housing and resources so that they can really have a second chance and avoid going back to prison. Because right now, lacking fundamental social services, it's very likely that when you are released from prison, you return to the same community where you committed the crime, where you arrested in the first place, you're much more likely to end up back in prison if you don't have a real path to having a decent life and providing uh, for your family. And I would just um, turn it around a little bit. Of course, equity and justice is, is absolutely important, but it's, it, it sets up an environment where health um, is just so difficult to maintain, that you've, you've set up, you just, you, you create an environment where um, people are just, as we've said before in this, in, in this discussion, uh, constantly bombarded by microaggressions or um, just the, the whole sense of, of unfairness that pervades life. David, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I think the points that my colleague made are, are so important about what can be done in the area of policing. And I would just add to that, there's even the, the town of Everett, not far from here, um, doing some, some innovative outreach at, the, at a very basic level of having police officers learn the language of some of the minority populations uh, in their community, of having police officers make regular visits to have lunch with the high school students so they get to relate 
uh, with police officers in the practical way, having police officers regularly attend community meetings so that the community also has a chance to talk to them and learn about them. So it's, it's really about building relationships, building trust, building respect, uh, all uh, patterns that need to take place hand in hand with all of the structural reforms that, that we need to see um, take place. On the point of the the threat that 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 many minority individuals live on on the of of interaction with the police, what research shows it's not just about interaction with p the police. I, I developed a scale called the heightened vigilance scale that asks individuals because of the possibility of discrimination. And people talk about how often they, they don't go to certain situations and places, how, how often they think about these events uh, before they leave home, how often they dress in certain ways to minimize um, be, being a, a victim and attacked. And what research shows is that high scores on the heightened vigilance scale it negatively affects physical and mental health independent of actual exposure to discrimination. So there's discrimination that actually hurts you, but because of the threat of discrimination, you are living on a state of, of physiological arousal that also has the a wear and tear on the body that has health consequences. So, so this is a priority issue that we need to find ways at a structural level, but also at an interpersonal level that we can reduce some of these experiences. Dwayne, if you would, for a minute, talk about accountability and what might be done uh, to uh, maybe a regular survey like this, or mm -hmm. what what could what could take place that would in institutionalize the, mm -hmm. what's needed to make these actions happen. Accountability is so very important, you know, for a lot of folks who think that um, that uh, we can own, that if we have the right policies in place, then we'll see the changes that we want. Um, if those, if those policies don't have accountability measures built into them, we're not going to see the changes that we want. We can look back to some of the victories of the civil rights movement, uh, the, Fair, the Fair Housing Act. You can look at um, uh, school desegregation, and we still see today that our schools are more segregated than ever before. Our neighborhoods and communities are more segregated than ever before. And then we had the, um, the Voting Rights Act, which was one of the only um, uh, um, efforts that was passed during that time that had any accountability measures that were put in place. And it worked very well for about 60 years until those accountability measures were pulled out. So to be able to uh, think about the policies and think about uh, accountability that, that's um, needed is really important. A community review board of police activities can help in um, establishing um, accountability. You know, there was a big effort uh, a few years ago for police to wear body cameras, okay? And, um, and that, that was good. Good policy, good technology, good use. And there were incidents that showed up and all of a sudden the cameras weren't working or they weren't turned on. <laughs> what was there? But what was the accountability? that was put in place. Did anyone say, well, if your camera's not working, then you just fired you out of a job? It was like, oh, well, we missed one. And so we can't miss one anymore, okay? So as we think about policies, thinking about accountability, and how do you hold people responsible for their actions in a way that makes them think differently about how they do their work is, is so, so very necessary. Thanks. Uh, Mary, you said something a few minutes ago about uh, eliminating criminal records on job applications as one, one method for, for lowering the temperature on in daily life. Uh, but what about housing? Um, I mean, housing showed up in our survey as a place where people had significant discrimination. Uh, what is PolicyLink doing in this area, and what would, what would you suggest? We, we do an array of things in the housing arena. Um, and a, a lot of, I mentioned a couple just in, in passing, that the question for housing can sometimes be a regional issue. In some markets, there's just a shortage of housing altogether. In others, uh, the question are matching rents to people's ability to be able to pay them or their ability to be homeowners. But I need to step back a little bit. I mean, we, you know, to, to answer the question real quickly, we do some work on inclusionary zoning. We do some work on affordable housing, on community benefits agreements that sometimes generate housing. But I, I think we need to roll the concept back and see that we have to reframe the question a little bit. Um, the narrative when it comes to housing, particularly, but in many of these arenas, is that we aren't looking at our policymaking process in a matter that enhances and advances equity. My organization, Policy Link, we um, 
we really see all things from an equity perspective and define equity as just and fair inclusion into a society where everybody can participate and prosper. We're not anywhere near that when it comes to our housing experiences in this nation. And if we don't address the problem, we're going to continue to see these widening rifts, this widening imbalance. And it's very, very evident in the housing realm. I'm here in Los Angeles, where we have a homeless population that, uh, depending on who you ask, is upwards of 55,000 people. Uh, but the majority of those people are African American and Latinos. So you can absolutely see who's being impacted by our housing policies right now. Um, you can say the same thing about people who were rent burdened here in California, but throughout the country, a higher percentage of people who are rent burdened, meaning that they're paying more than 30% of their income for housing, are going to likely be people of color. Uh, so what that is, is back to your survey, uh, back to the poll, the day-to-day -day experiences of people who are being denied housing opportunities, fair rents, fair sales prices, who are being subjected to gentrification, displacement, it's imbalanced because those folks of color, and particularly African Americans, are bearing the brunt of those policies that don't put equity first. So if I can just real quickly say that there's an urgency to this matter that we sometimes miss if we um, look at it as something that is the individual African American person's problem to solve. It's actually our greater society's problem to solve. Uh, the United States of America is on track to become a majority people of color nation by 2044. California is already a majority uh, state of, of people of color. And the majority of young people born uh, now in this nation are children of color. If we don't address the majority of the nation's ability to thrive, then the nation doesn't thrive. Then our regions don't thrive. Then our cities don't thrive. So again, there are a variety of specific housing strategies that can work. And depending on where you are in the country, sometimes there are local policies like rent control policies or um, assistance with mortgages so that people don't get displaced or recovering foreclosed homes and making them available uh, at low interest uh, uh, loan rates, which in some ways is a reversal of our Federal Housing Administration policy from decades ago, or land trusts, which buy up um, properties uh, in order to keep them affordable or more accessible to folks at various points in the income scale. Okay. Uh, and then there's the question, the question of just enforcing the laws we have on discrimination in housing. Any and all of those would work, but I'll, I'll stop where I started, which is to say we have to lead with equity. Thanks. Um, I want to leave some time for questions and answers, and Lisa Mirowitz is approaching <laughs> the front of the room so we can get some of those. Uh, I understand we have a lot of discussion online. We do. Thank you. And um, I was rushing up with all these questions. A number of them are really comments um, more so than questions, but I'll share one of those. Um, one thing that will help to reduce health disparities is the current move towards the complete health record, which includes social determinants. It will be a significant step in reducing health disparities and discrimination and needs to be advocated by leaders. I was just wondering if you wanted to comment on that. So there is enormous interest in add in uh, social determinants, uh, social factors to like the elect electronic medical record. There's been an Institute of Medicine or National Academy of Medicine uh, panel on that. Um, and yes, there is evidence that, let me give you a concrete example. At the Boston Medical Center, uh, right here in town, at the Department of Pediatrics, a primary care provider can refer um, a patient to a number of specialists. One of the specialists the provider can refer to is a lawyer. The hospital has lawyers on staff to solve the problems in the lives of their patient. Because if a mother brings a child that has asthma, and the asthma is secondary to the poor housing conditions um, in the home in which that child lives, all the asthma medication in the world will not help that child breathe free if the child is going back to live in the same conditions that made him sick in the first place. So e efforts to more comprehensively and link medical care to addressing some of the social problems that drive the health problems will have a positive impact. 
That was a great example. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here's another one. Again, this is m a bit more of a comment, but a great point. Quote, people acting afraid of them, unquote, statistic is really relevant and causes indirect trauma, no matter the socioeconomic status of that black person. And I don't know if, I think you were making that point also, David, earlier. I, I think I made that point. There's, there's scientific evidence confirms that that matters for health, yes. Mm -hmm. Here's a question that's more directed about the poll. Um, while it is easy to presume that people from certain states may experience more racism than others based upon where they live in the history of the states they come from, did the data look at geographical distance differences like that at all? Did respondents from states with a stronger history of discrimination report more negative experiences, or were the percentages roughly the same? Uh, so because it's a national poll, we just cannot look at it by 50 states. So there are some differences in the South, uh, but the I think a bit where Mary is, uh, there's a lot of history of discrimination in states that just aren't in the original uh, Confederacy. This issue has moved across the country. So there are subsets of states that have a history. So we could not tell it, but clearly uh, there are variances in people's life experiences mm -hmm. uh, of where they live. But the uh, takeaway to me it just was so uh, powerful. I have a view of making it to the suburbs. Sorry, it's a 50s view. Uh, and it really does not have a protective effect uh, for African Americans. A lot of the issues that people report uh, in cities suddenly stay with them when they move. And that is just n not the story that people told over 50 years. That's, that geography was supposed to really matter uh, of moving out of any areas that were low income and now you're suddenly in a different life. Were there other regional differences? No, not enough that... No, no, no. Uh, one of the things yeah, that I did yeah. find interesting is that African Americans in the Midwest have a, the, right. the percentage is slightly higher of people who have reported negative experiences with police, yeah. mistrust of the court system, <coughs> the, the idea that you, you can't even call the police when you need help. Yeah. It's a little bit higher among African Americans in the Midwest than the Northeast, which I thought was interesting as a Midwesterner myself. I'm a Midwesterner, too, and I agree. <laughs> um, I'll ask one more, and then we'll see if our audience has any questions. Um, what resources might individuals have access to if they feel they were wronged in a police altercation? What is the best platform to access a summary of rights when it comes to arrest, filming interactions with police officers, or refusing certain requests? Mm. I think people Mary, are just wondering what. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let's let's both yeah. address that. I've been on that on that receiving end and had to um, really think about uh, in terms of how do I react to a situation uh, where um, police are uh, treating me unfairly and what I perceive to be discrimination. And uh, one of the first things I do is um, I file a police report. And I felt it's important to file a police report because it can lead a, leave a paper trail of incidents and things that have happened. But in some places around the country, that can be very difficult for someone to do, especially if they have a, um, a fear of their police or their local government and others. There are groups like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund who uh, probably have resources available for folks to know exactly what their rights are and, and you know, and the NACP Legal Defense Fund is for everybody. So it's not just for African Americans to go to find out uh, this information. Um, but the more that we speak up and speak to our police officers about these things, um, even if it is going to be confrontational, the more that we bring attention to something that needs to end. If we don't, then it won't. So much of it, I think, is about accountability. As you mentioned, you know, the need to have civilian review boards, the need to have a real grievance procedure in place so that when people feel like they are being mistrust, uh, mistreated by the police, that they, there is kind of a process where their, their grievances and their experience can be heard and answered, I think, far too often. And this is part of the ongoing cycle of protests, especially with the use of lethal force. Um, police officers and police departments aren't held accountable. And of course, so many of these incidents and protests are the outgrowth of years and decades of um, systemic mistreatment of especially low-income African Americans. So we really need to kind of think about how we can hold departments and the criminal justice system as a whole more accountable <coughs> for its kind of racist and discriminatory dimensions. Mary, would you have anything to add? Um, I would say that there's, um, again, it's a, it's a sort of a jurisdictional issue. 
Um, local police departments are governed slightly differently. So I'd check if you were trying to see if your own uh, community force has a civilian review board or another kind of a monitor, a police commission in some places uh, where complaint processes might exist. But I'd also check to see what uh, community-based organizations are doing in your in your region. And there are a few nationally. Black Lives Matter has a tracking process. A group called Mapping Police Violence is another resource. So in the age of the internet, I think we can find a lot more resources to have available to us. Great. Thank you. Uh, does anyone in the audience want to ask a question? Thank you very much. I have a question to uh, Professor Blennon uh, to follow up on the uh, issue about uh, the um, breakdown by states, whether this information also can be uh, uh, looked at uh, in regard to the breakdown by age. And because, you know, aging population is an issue right now, and if there is discrimination also uh, based on this, there will be an overlapping compounding factor, age and race. We were just talking about this before we came in. Uh, so every time you do these surveys, there's a surprise finding that you have to apologize for. Uh, so uh, in where I, in my perspective, uh, uh, older people over age 65 grew up in uh, segregated, prejudicial environments, legal systems. So uh, I would pick up the result and say, okay, tell me about that era. And it turned out that ac almost across the board, our people over 65 are much less critical of, on all these dimensions. And it's young adults who I would say, you're in a whole new era, everything else, who absolutely, and I, and I think there is probably some acceptability. You grew up and that's what it was and I don't articulate it. And where new generations say, no way uh, for this. But across the board, I had the paper written which said, those who grew up in those other times, the scars are very deep. And now the paper will say, young people will not put up with this anymore. Uh, so it just is one of the stranger uh, findings that uh, there was less complaint uh, as you went down the age curve, and it just was a surprise to us. I, I would just yeah. add that that is true in studies of discrimination elsewhere in the world. In South Africa, that is also mm -hmm. true, that, that younger South Af black South Africans report higher discrimination than older South Africans, although the older ones lived on the, uh, the full-fledged apartheid, yes. um, and, and, and older African Americans in the U.S. lived on the Jim Crow. Um, part of it, I think, is absolutely right. It's, a, it's something about expectations. Discrimination didn't stand out 60 years ago. That was life. That was the way life was, and you just navigated it. But secondly, there's also a relationship with education. Younger people are also more educated. And, and, and one of the things you get in studies of discrimination is, is as, as you mentioned earlier, Bob, that, that many African Americans complain about the fact, I have done everything society has asked me to do so that I wouldn't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, is, it is the violation of that societal trust that is also a part uh, of the angst that, that many younger people feel about discrimination. All right. I, can I, I just make a quick comment on that point? Sure. And I have to do it in, in honor of my parents who were activists in the civil rights era who didn't tolerate uh, or, or accept and go along with uh, oppressive um, societal norms. But I think there's a tendency to say that even though you challenged me, even though you were aware of them, um, that's why you continue to live, frankly, is that you're able to say um, that if you, you know, that if you see the stress and the toll that it takes on us as African Americans, um, there has to be a way that you're able to continue to move on. And so I don't, I don't know that the finding that people aren't registering it as high of a, a, a disturbance in their lives doesn't mean that they weren't opposed to it or that's fighting right. it that's or right. aware of it. And that's, that's just it. the point that I want to make. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, and I'd like to uh, turn to each of you now and give us one policy takeaway. What, what would you identify as something that can be done here that uh, people who are watching this, um, influencers, uh, could do? Um, shall I start with you, Bob? Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm going to give the opposite recommendation that I do to my students. I tell my students, when you testify before the Congress, don't ask for more money for a search. Ask for something to be done for people's lives. But here it's different. 
And so in every community, there are surveys, the, uh, the Boston Globe, the Baltimore Sun, about life. There, uh, most city and county survey people about life there. I collect them. Not one of them asks whether or not you feel that you're discriminated against in this. So my recommendation is that people who do surveys in communities, whether voluntary groups and others, always have a module which asks you whether or not four or five questions, you are being discriminated, you, uh, uh, for that. Because we build this up, and uh, Duane's discussion, and we had this earlier, is a perfect example. He uh, went uh, to the courts over what happened. And so somebody working there could say, oh, there was just one incident. Oh, how did that happen? Uh, I, I, I believe if we had a county survey, uh, uh, the only difference is that Duane felt comfortable about going to the courts about the police. But people at the county or city or the Baltimore Sun level right. have no simple module, which just says a lot of minorities feel that they are discriminated against. So my apologies for calling for more research, but it would provide some <laughs> local support uh, for people getting off of it's an individual circumstance mm -hmm. to this is what it's actually like in Ferguson. And that, I, I think there are just a lot of media surveys, community surveys, that you could just add a small module that would raise this issue to. Um, I want to turn next to Mary, uh, because I know that you have to leave uh, very quickly, so, and we're going to lose your feed. Uh, what, would you, what would your takeaway be? Thank you. I appreciate you working with my schedule. You know, I think it is this notion of being intentional about addressing the kinds of problems that we saw represented in the poll. And that would mean that creating strategies in employment, for example, in contracting, um, specifically those two I'll, I'll stick with, but there are a variety of others that are focused on the outcomes, focused on being able to attach those marginalized and underserved populations, in this case, African Americans, to jobs in, in tech and clean energy, to, um, to jobs in construction if we're seeing communities that are, are development, uh, you know, seeing burgeoning development. Being intentional about uh, engaging those who've been shut off from good opportunities. I, I will acknowledge though that that doesn't get at the mentality and the morality. It's very difficult to legislate these sort of belief systems that go into the makeup of the person who not just in, uh, associates the microaggression, but might make the decision that affects someone's life. And so for that, this isn't a policy recommendation, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a narrative shift. We need to reframe how we look at each other in this society and recognize that it isn't your problem or her problem, it's all of our society, and we all have a commitment and obligation to make it better. Those things that make folks be fearful of someone because of the way they look or dismissive because of the way they talk, we need as a society to work through that so that we are not wasting the human capital that we waste. That's the biggest takeaway for me of this poll, how many people are excluded from society and aren't able to contribute for their own lives, their own families, and for our nation as a whole. It's such a waste, it's such a loss. Thank you. Yeah. David? I, I wanna build on the, the point um, uh, Mary just made about a narrative change. Um, we have research that indicates that both implicit and explicit discrimination is in fact supported by the deeply held negative stereotypes that are pervasive in our culture. So we need a narrative change. We need to change our culture. And that's not an easy thing to do, but it can be done. And it means we need to work with, with all the agents of culture, not only the news media, but the entertainment media, uh, so that we can start uh, changing the narrative and, and providing different messages uh, about, uh, about individuals and groups that are different. And then at the, at the individual level, there's much that we can can do. I, I like to point people to what, what I call the divine solution. Uh, Professor Patricia Devine at the University of Wisconsin ha has developed, uh, in fact, uh, a program, comprehensive 
uh, program that not only raises awareness levels and motivates people to be concerned about, about these issues of, of discrimination and implicit bias, but has been shown scientifically to be effective in reducing these biases long term. And, and more programs like that at a grassroots level in communities um, so that people get tools and skills can be learned to help people overcome some of these tendencies. Thanks. Elizabeth? So I'm a historian, and, and I think that if we're going to bring about that narrative change that Mary and, and David spoke about, we really, really need to reckon with our history, with the history of racial oppression, with slavery. I think there needs to be a major educational campaign in our schools across the country to really deal with what slavery actually looked like and its impacts so that people can understand the ways in which we carry these historical legacies and how racial hierarchies that have defined the United States from its founding continue to pervade our society and prevent us from living up to our basic founding ideals. Very good. And Dwayne? I would simply add that um, our public institutions, whether federal, state, or local, really need to um, be examined. Um, to see where the inequities are in place within those structures, within those systems. Um, engage citizens in that examination so that we can all contribute to how to repair them so that they work better and they work better together. And in the field of public health, I would love something similar to a Truth and Reconciliation Commission where we just lift up where we have contributed to inequities as a field to say, okay, that was our past. What is our future going to look like? But just put it on the table so that when we hear about people being afraid of going to um, receive health care, well, we've contributed to that, okay? Not just us, medicine as well, and others, but that's what I would like to see. I see. Well, thank you all. Uh, we're going to need to end the event now, but I would encourage you to continue the conversation at the forum website at forumhsph.org. Thanks, everyone.